Internet slash CB Fiber Governing Board meeting of the November 13, 2018 to order. Um, any additions to or changes to the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, any public comment? Anything that's not on the agenda that anybody wants to speak to? Great. Uh, next thing is uh, the hearing and feedback some hearing, hearing about feedback regarding the draft 2019 budget. So this would be a chance for individual representatives, alternates, or representatives from the towns themselves to weigh in and share their thoughts on the budget. And, uh, and we as a board get to decide what, what to do with that. Does anybody get a chance to talk to their select board, city council, duly elected representatives, and hear anything one way or the other? I met with my select board last night, and um, we talked about a lot of things, but I forgot to mention the budget. Um, but they're, you know, they were happy for me to not talk more, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of business. Okay. I did uh, speak with the town manager uh, uh, for Barrytown and um, did discuss the budget, but understanding that it was a you know, preliminary draft, he mm -hmm. didn't really have any other additional comments for it at this time. So. Okay. I heard nothing. I sent stuff to the select board members and no response back from them whatsoever. I mean, I, Williamstown silence is acquiescence. <laughs> there's, there's a. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass these extra copies of the of the agenda down. You can maybe just keep them on the end there with Dan or whoever. Um, yeah, and I I gave it to the Berlin Select Board, and they said, "Looks great," <laughs> and then said, "Off you go." Um, so I'm going to I'm going to assume that it's good that it's good too. Uh, did, do any of you have any bits of feedback? I know the um, finance committee. And it's probably part of your report back, Rama. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, we talked about it briefly at the, at the meeting, and the only email feedback I got was one comment that said, you know, this was just meant to cross T's dot I's and uh, just take it, take what we got and run with it. And so, I mean, what, we had maybe five minutes discussion about it. The budget, and then we just voted to pass it, you know, pass it back the way that it got presented into us. So there was no changes. It's the exact same budget that you passed around as the revised budget after the last governing board meeting. Okay. So it's not on the agenda tonight, aside from that, um, aside from the, the hearing here, sort of that information collection <coughs> portion. But I think for our next meeting, we will put it on the, the December budget so that we can pass it in advance of the end of the year. So if anybody has any other thoughts about <clears throat> what should go in it, what should not go in it, and maybe we'll have some more discussions uh, about that later on as we um, dive into some of the, the committee report backs. But yeah, the only point I'd make is that it has to be approved at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Unless, yeah, unless we have or else we have to have another meeting before, what, the 15th of next month? Yeah, let's not do that. Can I ask you if anybody has thought about having meeting for the public because you know I've been thinking about this select board as soon as they remember we can't tax people they're they don't yeah, care they <laughs> 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 um, we, uh, our town uh, puts out a, you know like a newsletter uh, every so often uh, with, I, I believe it's quarterly uh, to, to the, the members of the town and uh, and in that there's actually a snippet that I sent to uh, Jeremy it was like a, a really compressed version of what of, of what he had as an introduction to uh, Central Vermont Fiber so that, that way we're keeping at least our town you know folks up to date on what's going on with it have you gotten any feedback Did anybody contact um, you that or? that latest uh, edition of the newsletter hasn't gone out yet I believe it's due to go out at the end of this month I'll be curious to know if you yeah. hear anything back. Yeah, me too. So is that something that you all want to do, is reach out to your communities and solicit feedback in advance of the next meeting? Well, that's what I was thinking. I mean, I I, I know what my select board would have said had I been able to go there, because that, when when they first talked about this, they did mention, well, this is this is okay because you can't raise taxes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the pass. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, when I, you know, when I'm meeting informally with people in town, I, I get questions. You know, where's, where's the fiber? What's been done? <laughs> so it's, yeah. So I, it, it makes me a little bit nervous that 
I don't want us to think that because nobody says anything about our budget being bad or off that people are not expecting something to happen soon. That's well, I, I guess I would leave it up to, up to everybody here to reach out to your individual communities and if there's there's some way, you know, front porch forum post mm -hmm. and take snippets of the, of the of the report that we have and just say, here's where we're at. You know, do you have any feedback? And if they want to pass that through you, you can bring that here. Or if they want to physically come here in December, that'd be great. I mean, it would be great to have some public, some pu public meetings or public feedback rather. Do you have Do you have a <coughs> specific um, text that you that you think we should be putting out there, or should I just talk like me? Um, I mean, it would be from you. It would be soliciting information as yourself. Um, okay. Obviously, feel free to crib slash copy any materials that we put together, you know, from the, the the draft report from the budget from anything that we've had out there, and then your own interpretation of things. Yeah. I mean. Okay. So hold on, Michael. Is so, <coughs> I I deal with this issue a lot. There's the there's the conflict between giving encouragement to the community and um, soliciting um, <coughs> excitement and interest from the community and the holding back of the information because they'll burn out on their excitement too soon. You want to peak at the right time, just like in sports. Mm -hmm. And so one thought I had was uh, uh, the Business Development Committee's talking about surveying and beginning that process and we're, I think we're still evolving what it is we're about to do, whether it's going to be a pilot in a particular town or something bigger. And so it's almost a little premature to be saying a lot in the community. Um, I mean, there's nothing the matter with answering questions, but, <coughs> but, to, but to have a big meeting would be premature in my opinion. But in terms of what we're doing, sort of part of the annual report and the budget and the process, soliciting public feedback, I think, is appropriate in that case. Sure. And whether we're going <clears> to <throat> get everybody riled up in a particular one town or another and say, this is definitely coming now, that, yeah, that would be, I think that would be inappropriate. But I think if, if mm. we can ask people to get involved here, I mean, there might be, you know, alternates or representatives that might come out of that who want to participate or even better, be on committees, because they don't have to be on this board to be on committees, too. That's, that's important. <coughs> but what I'm mostly concerned with is, is the natural question that will come from anybody in the community is, when's it coming to me? Right. And the answer is, we don't know. Right. We're still talking about lots of versions of how to do it. Um, it's a similar subject, but I wonder if we want to prepare something for the town reports. Um, you know, one, certainly a, a short one-pager type thing. Um, that's different than what we handed out as our you know, status report. I think that would be good. In fact, the very city asked for that. Huh. And I said, you know, I said, you can take what we've presented, the draft. I said, you can take that, you know, and unless we revise it, that would be, I think that would be suitable. I mean, there's nothing that's changed or too different in there, but if we wanted to, yeah, if we wanted to condense it down to a, to a page or something, I think that would be easy enough to do. That's essentially what I did. Right. Because I took the draft, I condensed it down, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what, what's going on in our town reports. Mm -hmm. So, at our, at our business development meeting uh, earlier in the week, we, or last week, we uh, talked about that report to the town being some capacity for expanding the awareness of what uh, is going on here so that... Uh, as we go out later to help develop resources within the town, there's more awareness of it. So, but you use the report as sort of a double doing. I thought we were going to have, one was going to be prepared that was sort of going to be. So, I, I, I think there's a difference between the annual report to include in the town's reports and the sort of one pager that we envisioned at the business development meeting, which is a bit more forward looking, a bit more concrete. And more more survey ish. I mean, obviously, correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I, I, that was my recollection. You know, one thing we want to remember that, that somebody said something that, that made me think of this. Most of us are no longer going to have school meetings as part of our town meetings. 
starting this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we won't we we won't be meeting uh, for a school meeting anymore. It's just going to be a town meeting. We're not going to be electing school directors. If you're being forced into merger, that's that's the reality. So there's going to be I, town meetings going to be kind of weird. At least in my town, you know, it's usually a full day and there's a lunch and da 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 da. Yeah. So I don't know if that's an opportunity for people to maybe be willing to have other things to talk about, and especially in an effort that is kind of interesting that we're trying to work together as what 15 towns or whatever we are now. And you know, schools have been focused on the merger fights now for two or three years, and they've gotten pretty, pretty, uh, pretty lively in in this part of the state. Um, so maybe people will be be sort of interested in, in in an effort to try and pull together people from a great number of communities on a common endeavor. Sure, and and, that, and I've taken the opportunity in the like the other business for the end of the meetings to sort of put things onto the floor in the form of a resolution or in the form of essentially provoking a discussion and that might be that might not be a bad a bad way to go about it too way to think about it yeah okay. anything else on this okay. uh treasurer's report oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so we have a checking account and a savings account uh, yes. vermont state employees credit union uh, Rama and I opened that, um, I don't know, a few weeks ago, three, four weeks, something like that. Yeah, three, about three, yeah. yeah um, and uh, the current balance of our checking account is $200, and our savings account has a balance of $25. Wow. So, um, and then we have also had expenses of $20 to register CV Fiber. Um, and that was also, that was donated, <coughs> so. Okay, thanks. I don't think so, unless there are any questions. Um, the only question I have is on treasurer reimbursements. Has, has that subject been broached at all yet? You, because... Currently, though, yeah, those stand as donations. Okay. And that's fine. I'll let you right handle them however you want to then. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think if we end up with Accounts payable, that's something that, that the board should vote on and sign off on. So, mm -hmm. if, so if you wanted to get money back at some point, if somebody says, right. here's $100 for this, then I think we would all need to authorize that as a, as a check. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, just so everybody understands what I was asking about is that uh, Rebecca, uh, Becca rather, I'm sorry, actually put up $125 of her own personal money to open these accounts. So when I talked about the reimbursement, that's what I was referring to. Anything else for yeah. Is the organization currently accepting donations? It is. Okay. Thank you. And that, that will actually come up in a later agenda. Item. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. We'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lock it up. All right. Uh, anything else for the treasurer? Okay. Uh, contesting the CBI trade name, I'll hand this off to you, Rama. I think it's probably a you were the one who uh, well, got that ball rolling, and I will I will step in as necessary. All right. All, all, well, what I did was I contacted on my own initiative without any, you know, this had nothing to do with the board itself. On my own, I contacted the uh, Secretary of State's office, and I, I, I basically, and I, I don't have the email in front of me, so I'm not ready. I don't have a whole really big transcript for you, but... It's in the packet. Is it? Is it? Is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's on page, uh, starting on page five of the packet. So you can follow along. You can see the exchange between Rama and Secretary of State's office and me and some other folks there as well. Uh, let's see. All right, so starting at page five, yeah. Um... Okay, now that that doesn't have my first email actually. Well, the one he, yeah, the, the one I initially contacted him with him basically went on two things. One, because this is about the trade names, uh, C, uh, Central Vermont Internet, and uh, Mr. Whitaker, of course, had. Uh, it's two pages later. It's on page seven. Oh, is it? Yeah, page seven? yeah I have the, the whole email chain there. Okay, yeah, so if you go to page 7, you see the email. That's what I started with to contact them, and uh, 
I, I two things that I want that I thought should have been pointed out was one that the uh, the DBA is supplied for by Mr. Whitaker was done I believe in bad faith that was my you know that, that was that's my interpretation of it and uh, the, the biggest one and I think the most important one is that the the you them the Secretary of State's office I I honestly believe erred in giving out Central Vermont Internet as a as a uh, doing business as name. And uh, the short version is that name had to be on the warnings for the public vote, meaning that name had to be out there in the public. We were required to put that name out in the public 30 to 40 days prior to the public vote. There was a public vote where, where the municipality by the name Central Vermont Internet was created, and then the following day, the trade name was registered by Mr. Whitaker. So, I, my, the essence of my argument was quite simply that, uh, you know, they, they're not supposed to, and it does state in statute that they're not supposed to uh, give out a uh, trade name if it could cause confusion to the general public. And, and the essence of my argument is, but of course it causes confusion for the general public. The legislature, by the statute, wanted us to have the name Central Vermont Internet because that's what we picked. Nobody else was using it at the time. And uh, so now for somebody to have that as a trade name, for them to have to be able to use that trade name, especially in the Central Vermont area, would cause immediate confusion in the public as to, you know, are we talking about a municipality or a private business or what? So and that's the long and the short of it. And then I guess you were contacted and... Uh, well, yeah, I was in the loop for the, the whole conversation, which okay. was good. And I think what Chris Winters from the Secretary of State's office said is that he said, respectfully, Rama's complaint is interesting and brings up and it's sort of provoked an interesting conversation within their office. But they said that if you really want to contest this name, it has to come from the board. It's not something that can come from just an indiv individual who's, although, you know, associated, affiliated with, with the board, is not carrying the weight of the board's finding with it. So I'm going to read a little bit of what he wrote. Um, I'm going to leave out the citations to statute, but um, he wrote, uh, if you wish to proceed, it would be under 11 BSA 1636. This is the only way we can terminate a business name under the circumstances you described. That's what Rama was talking about. We have no other authority to determine or take into account bad intentions, previous use by others, or judge whether the public is likely to be confused. We can only look at a name similarity with respect to new names that may be confused with existing names. We get a citation. Um, he, talk, and he talks about his process. He said he would send a notice to you, to either Rama or the board, and to Mr. Whitaker that you have challenged his use of the name. I would convene a fairly informal administrative hearing at which I would take evidence, testimony, and documents from Mr. Whitaker on whether he is using the name as evidenced by a sub, sub, substantive act or acts consistent with that intent. He would have an opportunity to appear and present the board's side of this as well. Is that how you would like to proceed? If so, please also provide me with some assurance that you are acting on behalf of the board and with their consent and I will get the notice. <laughs> so, he said, here you go. Like, tell, tell me to make it happen. I move that we authorize continuation of the discussion with Rama and the Secretary of State's office in our name and that you ha have a letter provided therein to the uh, Secretary's office. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Um, yeah, why me? You started it. <laughs> you started it. <laughs> yeah, you started it. Yeah, you, so, so, so nobody so, knows more so about it than you now. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm fine. I, I just just want to know why specifically me. And uh, So, so you're, you're explicitly being given the authority to chase okay. this down. Yeah. And I, 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 I will be... Okay. And, and I will... And I'll keep any, you any copied in so that you're aware yeah. of what's going on with it all. Okay. So. I have to really trust me. I Thank would you. suggest, Roma, that you consult with an attorney, possibly Jim, <laughs> <laughs> just, just to make sure that you're not making the arguments that don't fall under their statute. You know, don't if if if, if you you're probably not going to veer back into the place of his bad intentions. No, no. But but there may be some other um, traps that would avoid you know prevent you from prevailing. Okay. So make sure you follow the statute. That's and, and as long as we don't talk about Act 250, I think we'll be fine on that. <laughs> but so, the meaning law. <laughs> well, there we, yeah, we don't have disagreements Anyways. on interpretation, but I, so, so I, I would just say then, 
Uh, my argument that I would make is quite simply on uh, what's that, page eight of the meeting packet, and uh, the therefore part, you know, that the trade name Central Vermont Internet was inappropriately issued to a to any other entity or individual as use in our region of that name will reasonably be expected to lead a reasonable person to conclude that the business is a type of entity that it is not and that's from 11 VSA so if there's any suggestions that you can give me from there as far as guidance what to walk away from what to push buttons on and I, I, I would be more than happy to include that but that would be the essence of my argument so let, let's let's the three of us loop this together okay. and then make sure that um, the Secretary of State's office gets that gets that language. And so I'll send so it around to you guys before I do any contact with the Secretary there was, of State. There was also a, a suggestion from Mr. Winters about current use of the name by Mr. Whitaker. If it has not been used yet, that's, that's cogent. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure you, you add that, that sort of Give me the first so any, anything he provided in his emails, you should <laughs> take as hints of what he's looking for. Did, did Chris or anybody else make mention of what recourse the losing party would have after the decision is, is issued? I think that I think the suggestion would then would be that it would be you'd have to file file suit. He didn't say there was another level of administrative appeal. I didn't get that impression. No. It might be worth asking. Yeah, I, th I think he did say that the next step. I think he says it quite like, somewhere in there bluntly. I remember yeah, that. It, it sounds goes like to the note that Chris court. feels he can make a de the decision, and I wouldn't be surprised that the secretary himself might be a second level of appeal that somebody could go to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here it is on, on uh, the email from Chris Winters on page six, towards the bottom, page six. Um, if you wish to proceed, it'd be under 11 VSA. Da, da, da. This is the only way we can terminate a business name under the circumstances you described. We have no other authority to determine, take into account bad intentions, previous use by others. Da, da, da. Oh, wait a minute. Um, if the, wait, do I scroll too sure. far? Section C. A person aggrieved by a final decision of the Secretary under this Thank section you. Yes. may appeal to the Superior Court of Washington County, which shall consider the matter de novo. So this Thank is you. the Administrative Procedures Act. Is that what that citation is to? It comes right out of the statute for registration of trade names. Uh, but names. it sounds like it's really coming, the procedure is coming from the Administrative Procedures Act, because mm -hmm. that, that's what's usually done, you go to the court after the initial decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure out when people are really going to lawyer up <laughs> and how, how much we should be thinking about that. As long as that 250 yeah. last. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Can't, he Wonderful. never goes away. Okay, so there's a motion and a second on, on the table. Any further discussion about uh, contesting the CBI trade name? And the motion was to um, essentially empower Rama to pursue his complaint with the power of, of the board. Our complaint. Our, our it's complaint. no longer my complaint. Okay. So to adopt Rama's complaint as ours, like a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't take the kitten this weekend, so you'll have to take it. Okay, any other commentary? Thoughts? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Um, it occurs to me that we have some folks here who may be um, joining us soon, and it would probably be a good idea to do a round of introductions. Um, so. Ken, you want to start us off and we'll just do a circle around? My name is Ken Jones. I'm from Montpelier. I've applied to be the alternate for the city of Montpelier. My day job is I work with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the strengthening of telecommunication systems in the state of Vermont is one of my tasks. Great. <laughs> I'm uh, Jared Thomas. I'm from Cal's. I reached out to my neighbor, David. Interested in learning more about CBI? He suggested I attend the board meeting. I'm a network engineer in East Montpelier. Welcome. So, Dan, we want to make sure Ken knows who everybody is. You know who I am? <laughs> I'm Dan Jones. I'm a uh, delegate from Montpelier. <laughs> Andrew Gilbert, delegate from Cabot. And I'm Alan Gilbert, a delegate from Worcester. And I'm Elliot Bent. I'm the alternate for Barry City. 
I'm Scott Massage, the alternate for Talis. Rama Schneider, uh, delegate from Williamstown. Siobhan Paracone, delegate from Orange. Rebecca Schrader, clerk and treasurer. Jeremy Hansen, delegate from Berlin. Phil Hayek, Middlesex. Jim Barlow, delegate from Marshfield. Michael Birnbaum, delegate from Plainfield. Joshua Jarvis, delegate from Barrytown. Bob Klein, delegate from East Montpelier. Tom Fisher, alternate for East Montpelier. Okay. Very strange camera man. Welcome, cameraman Jerome Lucan. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, finance committee report back. This is still you, Rama. <laughs> um, well, the biggest thing is just the budget that came out of there, so I, I'll go through, and if anybody, you know, if either of you guys or the treasurer has anything to add, please jump in. Um, what am I looking at here? Yeah, I need to the finance committee. So we did get some update, but we're going to get more update on the fundraising stuff, so I don't want to get into that. We did get a little bit of discussion from Siobhan about that. We did the, uh, the, the, the draft budget, which... We held the hearing, the public hearing on just a bit ago. It was, it was of course, approved as it was presented to us. Um, Siobhan is going to be working on a, uh, a set of policies and procedures. I, I, took, I, I took first stab at it, and she's going to take second stab at it. And then there's still some, and, and I'm, I'm going to use the, Alan, I just want you to excuse me. I'm going to use the term policies and procedures here. And, and I, I'm not being facetious when I turn to Alan and I say that to him because there's still some discussion as to what we mean by those words. So I, I'm using them basically to describe a way of, of defining broad requirements and then more specific steps that are required to accomplish those. Um, some of these policies and procedures, we may or may we we may not end up needing at at the committee or the board level. They may end up in, in a different you know, depending on how we uh, set up our organization, and you know who is actually going to be running things. For instance, will determine a lot of as far as uh, really where some of those policies and procedures go. The policies. I think whatever bylaws or policies are probably going to be there regardless, but procedures would be different. But anyway, those are still intended to come back in front of the board because at last meeting the, the board said go ahead and develop them, implement them if we need to, but they need to come back to the board for approval. So we are in the process of developing them, and, I, and I, I would, I'm hoping that we'll have something of substance for you in, at January. Or, by January, yeah, I, I think I was leaving December out of that, and maybe we may be ready by December. Uh, the financial institution, Becca already spoke to that. We do have a bank account, uh, a savings account. The treasurer does have a debit card. Um, the treasurer and the chair of the finance committee, which is me at the moment, I'm not the treasurer, Becca's the treasurer, I'm the chair of the finance committee as of right now, are the signers, uh, the check signers, and I did double check while we're setting it up, and it's, it's good that we did that, did that the way we did it, because if you replace me as chair of the finance committee, it's more or less just a matter of notifying the credit union and letting them know that the name has to change because we've already approved the position to do that. So it's, it's interchangeable, which is good. Um, zip books, we are using zip books now? Well, okay, I'll say Becca is using zip books for, for right now and uh, I guess if you want more explanation of zip books and how she's using it, you can ask the treasurer um, audits and compliance. So, th this is good. The, the scheduling now, at the last meeting, Alan had handed out a, a listing of dates, deadlines, that it's there in the statutory deadlines that are, we're required to meet. I have a different presentation, so a little more visual, because I, that's something I need when I look at these sort of things. But, um, Part of what, what we're going to have to work through because our charge at the Finance Committee is also has to do with compliance and the compliance has these series of reports that are mandated 
uh, and, you know, that are not just the budget, but there's also the finance report. There's also post reports to make sure that there's an end of the year kind of reconciliation report where we have to explain if we moved money among funds, et cetera. Um, a lot of this is actually going to depend on how we structure our operations. You know, um, I, I'll just use an example because it's easy for me, having just been very experienced with school boards. You know, you have the superintendent, you have the school board. The school board sets the policy. The superintendent runs the show. The you know the business manager takes care of all the business end of things. I. I suspect that's kind of where we'll end up going, whether it's, you know, by just contracting it all, stock, lock, stock and barrel out, or hiring a business manager. I don't know. No, I, that's just, I'm just saying I suspect. Um, but how we view these deadlines and what, what our oversight of compliance really depends a lot on that structure. Uh, the more directly that, w that we're involved as a, as a governing board, the more detailed we need to be as far as our oversight goes. You know, it's, if we're hiring, if we've hired a business manager or we've hired another company entirely to run the operations for us, oversight changes. It becomes much more general in a lot of circumstances. So, and, uh, and then, you know, the oversight of the deadlines, et cetera. So things, will, things change. So. We kind of at some point need to really get some guidance as far as what we should be thinking about for, a, I don't know, an operating structure for this. Uh, that's really all that, that we had uh, coming out of this meeting. So, it, you know, there, there's, we're going to keep plugging. My, my assumption, I'm going to keep plugging ahead under the assumption that everything's open, including the possibility that we might run day-to-day -day operations straight from the board. Not that I'm going to advise that, but I, you know, I'm not. If we operate under that assumption, we've covered every other base along the way because then we can just start pulling stuff out and say, well, we don't need to do that, we don't need to do that, and we don't need to do that, which is a lot easier than to try to define a system and then put more things in. I'd much rather pull out. Um, that's it, unless Bob, Siobhan, yeah. Becca. So, a general question kind of came up in the earlier discussion about when we, you know, presentation to the towns. Um, and just to throw that in, I had the same reaction that town clerk was like, oh yeah, I remember those things and presented them to the select board when I briefed them. So, they're all like, you can't tax it, right? No. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, <laughs> the philanthropic donations, and we can... I don't, we don't need to resolve it right here, but it's just something to think about. I, it dawned on me thinking, uh, I mean, actually, promissory notes, it dawned on me thinking about that and fundraising that we can't really issue notes without, there's a chicken and egg problem there. Yeah. Big one. And like, you know, there's some sort of guideline we're going to have to establish as to how much debt do we take on versus what our real revenue projections are on who we have. So I just, it's just something to think about. I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying we need to change anything or whatever, but I think ultimately it's going to be one of the one of the rules we have. It's like, wow, we really don't want to be issuing more debt because we'll never pay it, kind of thing. But anyways, that's just my general comment on the budget. In general, you know, like I don't have any issues with it specifically. It's just it's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I have some some good news and bad news in a, in a future agenda item when we talk about the preferred development route pilot projects yeah, or whatever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about that, I mean, from what I've seen in the promissory notes, the language that, that we got from EC Fiber, a lot of those um, explicit risks are built right into the promissory note. And it's written there saying, this could all go south, and here's right. how. And it's all laid out super clearly so that people who are taking, you know, who are issuing the, these monies to us that they know what they're getting into. So the amount of debt, you know, we're a public body and have a responsibility to the, to the public, of course. I, I, I don't suspect we'll be in a position where we're going to take on too much debt where we're, we're not likely going to be able to pay it back. Yeah. So, I mean, we're going to take on debt primarily for, you know, 
real capital buildings, right. right. Real buildings. Right. Yeah. And once that's built, if we do something silly like find ourselves not able to, you know, sell service right. to yeah. it, then then yeah, that could be that could be scary. Yeah. But I, I I don't think we're gonna be in the position where we're just going to <coughs> issue so many promissory notes, uh, so much debt. You see Fiverr had a little bit more of start capital just <coughs> and I guess that's maybe what I'm really thinking is we don't want to sell short, just give us money, please, without any ties so, to start. So <laughs> that's and, all. And um, they, they would have probably preferred to start with a whole lot more debt right from, from the get-go because they could have built their network better. And that's yeah. part, part of my, my report back there is going to be about that. So anything else? Uh, any other questions for the Finance Committee for Rama? Anything that you think that they need to be? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. It's just from my own personal understanding. The policies and procedures that you're ironing out, are those uh, strictly for the operations of the finance sector or, or are they going to encompass the entire entity? No, these are strictly to do with those areas that fall inside of the finance committee's okay. charge. Perfect, thank you. Um, while we're on the topic of those promissory notes, I did observe that uh, EC Fiber has a LLC. They formed an LLC. Um, yeah, those promissory notes are issued by an LLC, not by the district itself. So interesting. Yeah, I just thought that was an interesting incorporation maneuver. Yeah. I think that we need a bigger the legal line. Thing in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. I will have to have to look at that. I mean, and, and that might be required just by the way the, the bond market expects you to do things, like a wholly owned subsidiary. Blah blah blah. Okay, that's good yeah, to know. Just need to play. Yeah, I would expect whoever we bring on as counsel to help us track that <coughs> stuff is going to let us know what's, what's required. Anything else for Rama for the Finance Committee? Okay. Um, the Bylaw and Policy Committee report back. Uh, Jim, that's you. Sure. So a while back, the Bylaw and Policy Committee was tasked with developing a policy on handling data and business information that the entity might acquire from third parties that could perhaps be confidential. And how would we go about acquiring that data? How would we go about managing that data or that information internally? And how would we go about responding uh, to a third party if that data was requested from us? So with that task at hand, we uh, worked to develop the draft policy which was included in your packets or subsequent there too. Um, I guess I'll just hit the highlights on it and maybe there can be some discussion on it. So the policy that we've developed applies to data and business information uh, that the organization might acquire from third parties on a confidential basis uh, which could potentially be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. Uh, I think it's fair to assume that we are a public agency under the Public Records Act um, and therefore would, are, would be or are uh, subject to its requirements, meaning that any um, written or recorded information, regardless of physical form or characteristics, produced or acquired by our organization in the course of our business is potentially subject to disclosure in response to a request unless it is subject to one or more exemptions. So, um, so in the course of acquiring this information from third parties, uh, we want to be able to establish guidelines for uh, acquiring it and to manage that data and information to prevent unauthorized disclosure. Why? Because if we disclose this confidential information without uh, the authority of the, per, in the, uh, the group that's providing it to us, well, they're probably going to get unhappy with us and not want to do business with us anymore. We could be, cause them to incur financial loss or other difficulties down the road. So we need to have a plan in place as to how we will respond to such requests. So um, the policy sets out that we will, um, When we acquire confidential data and business information from third parties, we will provide the same care to avoid unauthorized disclosure or use as Central Vermont Internet will provide 
uh, to its own confidential and proprietary information. We'll protect your information in the same, with the same level of care that we'll provide to our own. Um, we will um, maintain it in a secure location as best we can. Um, and only our officers, governing board members, and agents who have been approved to receive such data shall be authorized to use it, meaning that we will not disseminate this freely amongst other folks outside of our organization, or even potentially within our organization, only on a, on a need-to-know basis. Um, we will only use this information under our policy in, further, uh, in furtherance of our organization's um, own interest and not for our own individual private or, or personal gain. So this is stuff we're acquiring for the entity for the entity's benefit, not for use by ourselves or for our own, own individual purposes. Um, we will not, under this policy, disclose data and business information that we acquire on a voluntary basis from a third party and for which a reasonable claim, from ex for ex claim of exemption can be made under the Public Records Act. So um, we will not freely give it up if it is likely subject to an exemption. And if there is a request made for a, made to our organization uh, for such information, we will promptly notify the third party of the request or demand so that the third party may seek an appropriate protective order or otherwise defend any right it may have to maintain the confidenti confidentiality of the data or business information under applicable law. So the request comes to us, and we say to the folks that provided it to us, hey, we've got this request. If you want to do something about this, let us know and step up and, and look out for your own interests. Um, one of the other key parts of this is that we, we, the statute under which we operate says, states that our clerk has exclusive charge and custody of our records. And therefore, it seemed appropriate that our clerk uh, be the point person for making requests, sort of the conduit for making requests for this, and for um, uh, potentially executing any <coughs> confidentiality agreement that the uh, provider may wish us to, uh, to sign for this. So the notion being that we would have a central point of contact rather than being 13 or 15 individuals out there making requests, we will all funnel this through one central point being the clerk. And since the clerk is the custodian of the records, the clerk essentially will make sure that this uh, information is managed appropriately. So in a nutshell, that is the provisions of this proposed policy. Any questions? Is this intended yes. to cover only third-party information, or is customer information included in this, or is that going to be a separate? I think that will be a separate policy. Uh, what, and from a practical perspective, we're about to start asking people for money, mm -hmm. private donations. Mm -hmm. is that, does that fall under this umbrella? Names, addresses, uh, donation amounts? Um, I would say that I cannot off the top of my head think of an exemption that would apply to the name, address, or donation amount um, of an individual that provided a donation to the, to the entity. So I, I don't think that there would be uh, the opportunity to exert such an exemption if a request for that information was made. If you make a, if you make a donation to your town, it's, it's not going to be um, exempt from public disclosure unless you make it anonymously. One, what? One, <laughs> I mean, okay. One one thing that I, I think we want to make clear, and I want to make sure I have this right, what we're talking about now is not information that we ourselves have produced no, in any way or gathered. We're talking about information we've gotten from third parties. So right. your question's a good one, Elliot, but I, I, it, I can't imagine Washington Electric has a list of people who have contributed to, well, actually they do, because they... We can, we're sometimes asked to give our, our member rebates to whatever philanthropic uh, fund they have. So, I mean, technically, I guess they have names. But I, I, that would be treated the same way that all, any other information we would get from them would be treated. If somebody wants to see the names, we'd say, you've got to go ask Washington Electric Co-op about that because we've signed an agreement that we won't give out the names until consulting with them so they can assert their privilege if they think they have one to not hand over the information. But direct do donations to a municipality would be public. 
which makes sense. Well, that's a whole other question. It is. It, 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 that is you, your statement is correct, but it probably doesn't directly apply to this policy and how this right. would be, how this would, how this would work out. Okay. Yep. So in practice, somebody says we want the Washington Electric Pole data that yes. you have, um, and we say to them, we have to go ask Washington Electric. We go to Washington Electric and say, this person asked for this. Can we give it to them? Mm -hmm. Who then responds? The, the clerk to this, I mean, the person is, the, well, okay, we'll have to ask Washington Electric. And Washington Electric, does the Washington Electric say to the clerk, yes, they can have it, no, they can't have it, and then we have to respond to them and say, Washington Electric says we can't give it to you, or well, does Washington respond directly to the asker? Under That's this policy, that Washington Electric would, would um, have the opportunity to do what it what needed to do or wanted to do to protect that information. We would have to respond as being the custodian or potential holder of the record, but they could also step up and, and, and assert whatever rights that they have or opportunities that they have to protect that information as well. Could I make a suggestion that might make, I think might make this more clear? Mm -hmm. If we can say that any, any of this data remains the property of, the, um, of the, the third party in question and that we are only dealing with it on a transitory basis for the purposes of our own business, We'd like to do that through a, a confidentiality agreement that spells that out on a case-by-case -case basis because that may be the case for some, but others may simply decide to give it over to us without, mm -hmm. without right. that. So, but in particular, for like the, for the, the WEC data, I think we could say we're using this on a transitory basis. This remains yours. We are not taking this. We're not acquiring it. We are not, not acquiring We are not going to acquire it. It stays on your servers, and we are going to make arrangements so that it is yours and not ours. So that we could generate reports or derive information from it that yes. could be useful then, which that material in turn could be then conceivably requested as a public record. The thing that we generate from their material. Yeah. Yes. Again, this that this policy would not apply to the thing that we generate. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a question about the whose server does it live on and things like that. We don't have servers. To, is the email attachment considered secure enough if we're trying to maintain security of this data once we do have it or handling it or whatever? Are you asking me a technical question? Or are you? Are we involving <laughs> that in the policy that we're going to have some policy around someone who's in charge of the security of the data? There was a specific language I had put in there that said appropriate controls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because within the parlance of you know infosec and everything else, yeah, that if we're not we're just not in a place where we can establish any of that yet. But obviously, we you know it goes hand in hand. You wouldn't want to take the data if you didn't have some mechanism to keep it reasonably secure. Um, and we're just going to have to work on that you know as we go. In, in, in involve that. I mean, you know, someday do we have like a, an information security officer? Who knows? Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, and sorry to get additional clarity, but this this policy only applies to third party data. So we are not <coughs> carving out business practices or proprietary information for the board as a as an entity. Right. So as we made a decision to go to. You know, just, this is just an example. We made a decision to go to Callus in this room. It goes on Orca. Our, com our competitors are, are able to see that. Mm -hmm. They're potentially able to build out to a place that isn't built out yet, mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, short, short of the statute changing to allow us to protect that data. OK. So I had two questions, and both both the previous two questions lead into mine. Uh, first one is, should, should this language directly reference NDAs in any way, or is it just assumed that that's inclusive? It, it does, um, does state that um, the clerk shall be authorized to execute an agreement with a third party for the protection of the confidentiality of data or business information, provided that no such agreement shall conflict with the provision of this policy. So we're not going to enter into any NDA that, that conflicts, this, that with, conflicts with this, with our policy. That's good. So my second question is in reference to the limitations of the legislation creating the CUDs. Um, after you and your committee have worked on this, are you reasonably comfortable now that we have enough protections for third-party data? 
and other future type things like Elliot was suggesting? Or do you think that we should pursue some amendments to the legislation to strengthen our abilities? I'm going to pass on answering that. Okay. I, 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 I'd like to weigh in on that. I, I, mm -hmm. I think it would probably be best to pursue the belt and suspenders approach and at least tr you know, look at the legislative <coughs> options for protecting some of the competitive materials that we might provide and be able to you know, specifically find, this board specifically find that this data is, we're going to declare this as a you know, competitive trade secret of some sort. It's not something that a regular town could do, because towns don't compete mm -hmm. like that. But if we are engaging in a competitive activity, we should be able to declare data, specific data related to that endeavor as being exempt from public disclosure. Mm -hmm. It's not in the statute now, but I think we could make a strong case for that to the legislature. I don't think it has to be in the statute, actually, because that's covered by a general <coughs> exemption in the Public Records Act. I mean, there are lots of municipalities that, that, that don't give out information, sometimes on the basis of, of trade secret. I, a utility that's Burlington Electric, for example, is that a municipality, Burlington Electric? It's not. It, it, it is the <coughs> instrumentality of a municipality. I don't know right. that it has its own charter, its own existence outside right. of Burlington. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive. I, I remember cases where BED would not give out specific information based on the trade secrets exemption. Mm -hmm. So I think one, one of the things we have to keep in mind is we can't make up our own rules on what we can give out and what we can't. Right. Because it's, we're, we're a public entity and we have to abide by statute and what's in statute. And what we're going to find, I think, is not that there aren't a lot, aren't, we're, we're going to find we don't have to invent exemptions because there are so damn many exemptions in state public right. Most, anybody who wants to dive into this can spend the next couple of weekends just going through the 200 and right, it's probably over 300 exemptions to the public records law. A good, a good many of them deal with trade secrets. I don't know. Yeah, so, I mean, I talked to the general counsel, the former general counsel of DFR. She'd been general counsel for 30 years. She says she said there's absolutely an exemption yeah. for proprietary data. Yeah. Absolutely. So, <coughs> so maybe what we so, need to do to cross T's and dot I's is when we run into that situation, we need to have a finding where we declare such data to be proprietary or a trade secret or. Oh, when you Something. get a request, you're supposed to cite a specific statute that gives you the right not to hand to turn over the record. But it w I think it would be better as a public entity to say, you know, our customer data or whatever, whatever we say, that we are explicitly stating we hereafter consider this chunk of data to be proprietary. Mm -hmm. That way when somebody requests it, we can say, we found this stuff to be proprietary back in this state, and pursuant to this part of the statute, we're going to, we're go we're going to call for that, that car out of right. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Thinking ahead about this stuff is a good idea. <coughs> if David had taken the information he got from Bill Powell and put it on one of his maps, would that would that be covered, the map, the product? The, the product would not under this. Yeah. Is there the product might be subject to a separate exemption uh, for proprietary business information, trade secrets. Mm -hmm. um. I was just going to ask if the committee is going to draft a confidentiality agreement, or if I should do that, or if you <coughs> should do that. I think at some point one will be drafted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I Hopefully don't, before we get any information. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. Maybe we might. Think about it a little bit before, but let's. First of all, I think typically the provider of the information is going to want you to sign their sure. agreement. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we start okay. from there. So I think that we'll see what you know. Once we get a little further down that path, we'll see if we need one, okay. and and probably at that point we'll have. If we do need one, we'll have someone else's model to work on. Yeah, this isn't a question so much as a statement, and I don't. I want to get the statement in somewhere, but we're starting to give the clerk some responsibilities which could put her out there legally. 
And I really think we need to start thinking of it as an organization how we can indemnify. You know, how we can start making sure that if, if they're... <laughs> I don't want to see Becca personally hauled into court if she's defending the board here, you know. So I, I, I just, mm -hmm. I don't know where or when we start dealing with that, but we've got something that needs to come at a certain point. How does that work for town court? Yes. They get bonded through the town, through the uh, town, through their insurance, right? I, that's yeah. the way I'm used to seeing it done. And our board has, you know, I'm on another board, we have board insurance. But there's also a, there's a, a, a limited or qualified immunity for public officials. Basically, and you can't be, if you're a member of the select board, you can't be sued in your individual capacity. Right. If you are, what effect, effectively has to happen is that the municipality steps up and defends for you. Okay. And I haven't researched at all how that might apply to this board. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've seen cases where those people are listed as defendants and the judge just says... You're dismissed. Yeah, it just That's right. clears them off and then the municipality or the you know, overarching correct. organization stays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, is, this might be too far afield, but one other piece that sort of segues, I think, buttresses against this business development. So probably would want to have some sort of language to let potential donors know that their personally identifying information will be available to the public? Probably. Well, I don't want to scare donors away, but I also don't want to like... Probably be just their name. Okay, just their name, not their email. They should, their... well, yeah. They well, we need a customer database, you know, like we need no, a donor, yeah. donor database. <laughs> <laughs> we can't just like... <laughs> Take their money and be like, okay, so, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> so you certainly don't want to ask for their socials, and you certainly wouldn't use their right. bank account right. numbers. So, so are you know, is donor information considered proprietary business data? It, 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 I mean, I I can't conceive of it being legally allowed to be right. I mean, as a public entity, if you're taking money from anybody, you need to be able to indicate. We're not a super. Your, your name, address, and your phone number are publicly available information. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to flag. I don't know if this is the germane moment to be talking about it. Okay. Anything else about uh, bylaw policy committee? Questions or suggestions for Jim or other folks on that committee? Were you looking for this to be accepted tonight? We can if there's no no proposals to amend it. Do you have a clean copy? Yep. So the motion. So I'll make the motion that we. Accept the policy on. Um, so before I say this, should I be saying CV Fiber or Central Vermont Internet, or does it matter? Okay. So I, I move then we accept the policy as presented for our CV Fiber, Central Vermont Internet Governing Board policy on data and business information acquisition and retention. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Thanks for your work on that, Jim. You can just pass it around. Yeah, and, and let's recognize the other members of the committee yes. as well. Thanks Bill? to everybody on the Time committee for yes. Thank you. So, yes. That yes. so just a point of information. Have we now adopted that, or have we had a first reading and it goes to a second reading? I <laughs> uh, don't know that we've done that in the past. We can definitely change our policies I don't know that we had a. Did, did, did we have a policy or an adoption of policy? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with it was just adopted. Yeah. And if somebody <laughs> wants to, uh, if somebody <laughs> wants to stretch this out, they want to act like the, the house or something like that. I'm just saying. We can always <laughs> move to amend it in the future. This is true. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this is going around. Uh, sign for your town, please, if you're. Uh, voted against it or abstain, don't sign for your town. Can I ask a technical question on this, too? Does it matter if we call them bylaws or policies? Yes. Mm -hmm. The only reason I'm asking is because the, the enabling statute strictly refers to our ability as a governing board to create bylaws. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's a distinction without a difference, with a difference, who cares a difference, what... I mean, what I know is that usually a nonprofit has to file their bylaws with the Secretary of State's office. And then the way you operate, you do through policies, and then a next level down is procedures. 
So I, I yeah, I, I thought it was kind of odd in the statute, actually, the way they just tossed out that word without really defining mm -hmm. what they expected. Um, typically, bylaws are, are organizational documents that set out you know, structure and voting and things along those lines. Yeah. All those things are set out in the statute that, by which we operate. So effectively, in my mind, those are our bylaws. And the things that we adopt to guide our future decision making and actions are our policies. And if we had a charter, I think that would be a way to extend our bylaws mm -hmm. according to state law, anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, just a, just a logistical question, tactical question. So we're signing this. Um, what uh, what are we doing in terms of setting up? You know, is there going to be a separate Google folder that has constrained permissions? Is that the gist? Okay. Good start. I, I just want to. I would expect so. I, I just want to like have like you know a logical next step. I believe so. To be honest, too, uh, part of what I think we thought was let's be a little careful about what we ask for to start. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> like you know, have a reason for it, so it's not you know not burdening ourselves with something we're not ready to manage. But not to say that we can't ask for it, but just let's be thoughtful. Business Development Committee report back and request. So uh, Jerry Diamantides is not here today. Um, let me see if I can go back to my. Thank you. The minutes from the Business Development Committee meeting. And feel free, folks who were there, to uh, fill in the blanks. Um, so we had a kind of wide-ranging discussion. Um, about possibly incorporating a 501c3 in order to pursue different sorts of grants, um, how much that would cost, going after a fiscal agent. Um, Jerry was going to write a paragraph for the governing board about this idea, but that, didn't, that sort of got lost in translation. I expect we'll come back to that probably at the next meeting. It's probably my fault for sending out uh, minutes just within the five day period. Okay. So. Um, all right, and so um, we had a, a talk about uh, fundraising, and here's where here's where the shakedown happens. Can you sign this? Shakedown with the word. Can you put the date on it? Sure. I'm just going to forget. Shakedown. Only up. So, um, Jerry, 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 Jerry. so <laughs> in order to get us started, at like a lot of um, nonprofits do, is um, we're going to expect the board to be at 100 percent donor rate, right? So we're going to ask for each of you to contribute $250 and to raise an additional 500 from your bestest friends, relatives, enemies, select board members, and such. Is this and, up for debate? And well, let, well you got to finish the, the, the heat you wanted to like. Have right. the pin drop, but <laughs> but it should be emphasized that this is there's no mechanism for enforcement here. There's there's no sort of you know nobody's gonna be watching. Nobody's gonna be keeping tabs on what people do or don't do, basically. And it's a suggested it's a suggested amount, suggested approach. So you so you come to the potluck, right. and it's twenty dollars suggested donation. So we're making the suggested donation two fifty. If that's uh, if there's a there's a Better number for you? I have a better turn of phrase. <laughs> sure. I would like to change it to one of these two. Board members are expected to make an annual financial contribution that would be considered generous for them, or board members will give annually at a level that is meaningful to them. Sounds great. Because we are not precluding people who are fairly impoverished in our small communities yeah. from being board members by setting a dollar amount. That's a great point. And I think that the business development committee would probably would probably accept that. I think we were just pick, picking a number out that seemed reasonable. I certainly agree with the uh, the intent. I mm -hmm. certainly agree with that. But I'm very concerned about representation on this board. And, For sure. And I think we need to be able to be open to people who do not have the resources. And two hundred fifty dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. You know, I I think we also have to be careful what a public entity can suggest or require a member to do. 
I, you know, we're different than a private entity, and um, I, I, I don't know if there's any any law in this at all, but it would be really odd if to serve in a school board you were expected to make a donation. So yeah, it's certainly not an expectation. It was. It's a. Um, we are we are hoping for everybody to to yeah. participate in in this way. Yeah, and and maybe and maybe the way to to frame it would be that 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 is something that the business. Development committee agreed to bring to the larger board, but it's not something that we would expect the larger board to codify or vote on, right? Mm -hmm. Like we voted that as a recommendation to the board. It's not something they need to adopt. So a twist of the arm and not a procedure or policy. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. <laughs> By the way, Alan, I would like to say that as a school board member, when you do your budget, you are making a contribution yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so people would argue with that. <laughs> it's not voluntary, but is this part of the like you know, was it is this part of the whole like how do we unveil a, just a donation capital campaign anyways? Because then it it makes it all a little softer. It's like, here, we're going to do this. And like, I have no problem, A, personally, about some of them giving in or beating on some people in town, but it's easier to do that when it's kind of seen as there's like a capital campaign going on, mm -hmm. even if it's, you know, whatever. But at least there's like one or two, there's a website to go to, or there's mm -hmm. one talking point, or whatever, because then it uh, makes it a lot easier. So I, I don't know. I didn't know where. You know, cart, this is a little bit cart and egg. I understand. Right. We just want to get something in the coffer and get the ball rolling, right. which I have no problem with. But. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the instinct was that if we have the board starting, right. it's a little That's, bit. It's an easier sell going to, you know, John Doe X yeah. in Cabot or the your, your Cabot right. Economic Development Group and saying, right. hey, right. you know, we've we're we're getting started. Yeah. You know, can you come That's on board with us? Yeah. And you know, here's where we are. Anything else you wanted to add to that, Elliot, that we... So I, I, I do have a question about that. So if, if I'm asking my neighbor for 500 bucks and he says that's great as long as it's tax deductible, I'm going to say, yep, we are a, a public uh, nonprofit. In fact, we're a municipality. And he'll say, what's your tax ID number from the IRS? We haven't yet in. Yeah, that's going to be on, um, so I, I am working on the receipt, but it's going to be like you get from charities. It'll say right. no goods or services, right. and it'll have our EIN on it. Okay. And, um, that but it's not a 501c3. Right. Not that it's a 501c3, but that it is a municipality. The, the, the donation is tax deductible to the fullest extent of the law. This is all your tax advisor. We are not attorneys or That's what we have on here. <laughs> <laughs> so like pharmaceutical ad. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there is, a, there is the, a part of the tax code, it's like a section 107 or something like that, which municipalities and uh, as nonprofit organizations that can receive charitable donations fall under. I, I, I don't remember. It's, it's 10-something. Yes, it, but those donations have to be made for a public purpose. I can't give it to you, select board member, for your good deeds as a select board member. Of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, yes. Yeah. Unless you call it a bribe. So right. <laughs> <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we soliciting a central Vermont internet or central Vermont fiber, which is the? I, th I, 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 I think, think C fiber. CV fiber is what we've all agreed CV fiber is a word okay. yeah. Although if we got to check for central Vermont internet, I suspect we could. Okay. So, <laughs> So the other, the other, I think or the does other. Or Steve Whitaker get it? <laughs> <laughs> I think the other piece of this is that we need some, you know, props and materials to yeah. do this. Um, so I, I got a preliminary website up. Go to cvfiber.net. There is a page. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, All the computers uh, come it, out. Yes, yeah. it's on a temporary server. So at some point we'll have to find some funds to to move it, but. And or do it because it's not very you know I don't it's not my day job that's it yeah there you go. oh yeah. cool um, I brought my I brought my camera here tonight so we can take a group photo to put on the website and to put on materials as well um, and I will be taking that language and probably you guys will have lots of comments on it uh, people will take that language along with Jeremy's FAQ and be working on just a one pager leave behind as well. Um, now that we have a checking account, I can also get on a, an online portal up um, with with your, you know, sort of 
with the, the authorized agent's approval and blessing. So we can do that. Okay. Um, I did hear back on a related note with the website. I did hear back from uh, John from Roxbury, who's not here because of the um, because of all the snow and whatnot, and, and another meeting he had tonight. Um, he did talk to his friend who was offering or is possibly offering free web hosting, and that person said it sounded like they were at least interested, but that their schedule was basically packed full until uh, earlier next year. Yeah. At which point that he said he'd circle back around and be willing to probably come back to us. It's still a little bit of work in progress, so, you know. How did you take a grain of salt? What's that? Oh, I <laughs> well, it's WordPress. It's, not, it's a quick WordPress install. So one, one quick comment. Um, when we formed uh, Cloud Alliance 15, 16 years ago, it was just, uh, it was a community thing. A uh, town of Plainfield formed it. And the first people to contribute money were called Plainfield Pioneers. So we, if we can do a little alliteration about Central Vermont Fiber in some way for the early donors who, they're saying, well, what's this for? Is this for the early organization? It's not, you know, we're not building anything yet, but you're a pioneer or something like that. That might be an approach. Cool. The fiber strands. <laughs> so, the warp and the weft of the fiber of our lives. I, I'm starting to get and, and this is probably more me and how I interpret things, but I'm starting to get kind of a... I'm getting confused. Should we be waiting now? Because I hear suggestions about, you know, waiting for some sort of a an organized outreach, um, having some form of, you know, moniker for whoever puts up or having some sort of organized goal or, or are, are we waiting till something organized gets passed out to us and says this is the material to use go out and get money or are we being asked potentially to walk out of here or find somebody on the street and ask them for money uh, I think all of those. Oh. so so I think I think the business development committee is work we're working on materials and those will be forthcoming <laughs> soon but some of those materials we're not going to be totally clear about what that should contain until we can answer some of the questions about the preferred development route and some of the stuff that we got from uh, David Healy I think that will help okay. yeah. and, I, and I'd also just say you know I mean you know the the idea this is this is sort of a quick and dirty fundraising strategy right and the idea is that we're drawing concentric circles out from ourselves essentially yep. right so we start with ourselves then we go to people who know us and trust us and maybe don't need a piece of paper, maybe don't need to go to an internet you know, website, do due diligence. And then the next circle out, I think, is are those folks we might have connections with but need to have that sort of tangible asset to, to figure out what's going on, right? Okay. So okay. I think we just get started with those two initial circles and then we get going on that external okay. circle okay. as we can. So yeah, if there's somebody really fired up in your community that are, that's interested in seeing this succeed and they're willing to help help us in the beginning parts of what we're building here um, so that we can do things like you know, get a post office box, um, get, get office supplies and some of these other sorts of things so that we don't have to rely on our intrepid clerk treasurer to uh, fund all of it. If, if we have somebody who wants to give items instead of money, we, are we open to that? Yeah, like it's, office supplies. Or? I would, I would say so. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the tax layer becomes a little trickier um, in my very limited experience with Inkind. Inkind um, donation, but it's it's, it's, but uh, it's still do it. you can still do it. Really, most of the people I know don't do the tax yeah. things. They just they don't have any cash, so they'll give me. Mm -hmm. I think we're good with fiber. Yeah. <laughs> See, the answer to this is series of tubes. <laughs> yeah, unless we want to put fiber through the rolls. <laughs> Four minutes counting it. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was that. Um, we talked about uh, grant funding, a couple different um, angles looking at uh, talking to the, the legislature when the um, budget is being drafted talking to the governor's office you know is there a way for funding to be 
procured for communications union districts in particular, or you know, public um, public development, uh, USDA. Um, I've been, I expect to have a meeting with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission in December. Um, there's probably not going to be lots of funds coming from them, but they, they may have in-kind services that they can provide. Um, ACCD, our um, future um, alternate from Montpelier, is, uh, you know, could be our lifeline over there, and they, they may have planning grants and other things that we can look at from there. This is other stuff that we talked about. Um, and yeah, um, we're ta we talked about putting together a fundraising plan for calendar year 2019. Um, something that we didn't talk about that I want to call out is that there is a, um, a draft RFP from the, uh, the Connectivity Fund for the state of Vermont. They actually have a list of all the addresses which, they, which the state has decided are, is, are underserved. And I went through and I pulled all of our member towns um, and I found, what did I find? That's going to be updated in a couple of weeks. It, it, it will, as, pe as different organizations challenge whether right. they're... In the challenges have already gone in and yeah. they're codifying. Yeah, I, I found that from EC Fiber. So <coughs> at, as of right now, we have 719 that are uh, allegedly underserved, but that will, number will probably come down a bit. I was very happy to see my own address where I just moved is on that list. So um, <laughs> quite a lot in Worcester, quite a lot in um, uh, Middlesex, Elmore, so underserved means they don't have DSL. They have dial-up or satellite. No. no. Four, four down, one up is what's less than four down and one up is considered underserved in the state. Okay. So if they claim that we get more than that, <laughs> then, then it, we it won't are underserved. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, ostensibly, I have DSL at, at my location. I get, I do get better than, than 4 one <laughs> not much and not most of the time. Yeah, same. But again, it's yeah, it's up to the providers to say, hey, you know, we're we're, we're good on these, and and the idea is that uh, service providers that will go to these locations and cover them will get will get some money to do so to bring them above 4 ones which is a pretty darn low bar. So those things you found are just within our. Uh, district or I, I, I feel I just have it in an Excel spreadsheet. I just took what I got from the state. I just chose our 16 municipalities. There's none in Montpelier, for example. No one. I, I, I wasn't, wasn't talking about, but you know, in terms of the discussion we've had about where to start a pilot, uh, you know, is there anything that's leaping out from that list as far as? There's no, I mean, pr pretty, pretty much what we expected, where we expected. Mm -hmm. There's really no, no surprises. And I think. Um, Michael's right, you know, once these numbers, once this gets scrubbed and the, the, ch the addresses are challenged, it'll be interesting to go back and see what's actually marked as, as underserved. So we'll see, but I mean, there's the, the addresses I see, for example, in Berlin are, are fairly far afield, um, you know, out, out at the end of, you know, rural dirt roads. Um, like, yeah. So I'm thinking like, uh, Class three or four? There was, yeah, there's a, a, a friend of mine in uh, Worcester, let's see, in West Hill Road. There was a bunch on West Hill Road, Minister Brook. Oh, yeah, that's Minister Brook. I tell you, we got a trifecta in Hampshire Hills on there. Hold on. I mean, they all come together. Well, he's uh, there, is, there are uh, two, uh, three addresses on Hampshire Hills. Yeah. That, that, that's the trifecta in Worcester, right? There are a lot of people who I think have money who would like to get high speed internet. Holtz Road, Elmore Road, yep. Eagle yep. Ledge. Yep. So, I mean, those is, are. Is that list that you posted on Google Docs that we could see? I, I, I got it from the Connectivity Initiative site. I mean, I can I can put it out there, but it's really just a. I just really got it from the state and just filtered it. But yeah, I, I can put it out there. Okay, why don't you do that? I think we'd all probably all like to see this. There's there's a map as well. Oh, they did a map? Oh, sure. Oh, I didn't see that. That's a lot easier to use. I just got this yesterday, so. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'll put the um, Excel of the underserved, I should say the finger quote, underserved. I'll put that up. I'll get the link to the map to you.
I just forwarded you an email about the Think Vermont Innovation Grant Program. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, designed to fund projects in areas that have been identified as crucial to the growth of, the, of Vermont small businesses. The areas include these areas include those that number three enable or support broadband telecommunication access. So. Nick Grimley in your office. Yes. He, he receives those. It says. <coughs> Okay. Is that some, so it says the appropriation for this program is $150,000, and that's across the whole program. That's cool. So if you go after, you go after a little bit, it's, a little the, bit. Ten. it's the juice worth the squeeze. Yeah. Is some, somebody going to write this grant? We can approve them, force them to do that. Takers? What I'll do is I'll provide what the guidelines are because they're still being developed. Okay. What's, the, what's the deadline? Uh, December seventh. December seventh. You better get so, going. <laughs> <laughs> um, Two submissions, are, submissions are accepted until the funding has been allocated, or December seventh, whichever comes first. So it could even be sooner than December seventh. If somebody's willing to sit down and just plow through this, you know, over three hours or four hours, I don't think I could devote more than that. But I could sit down with somebody. I'll help. And do that. Okay. Okay. I think I, my one piece of advice would be to make sure that we get those requirements because mm -hmm. we might find that we're just not committed. Right. So, because of the short timeline, if we can just make that a yeah. sort of yeah. like a tactical decision, and what are we ask? So, what are we? What would we be asking for? For what? For doing our initial planning? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion that we uh, authorize myself and Siobhan to. Um, apply for a grant to the Think Vermont Innovation Grants. Second. Okay. Second by Dan Jones. Any other commentary, thoughts? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. Great. More stuff to do. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> right. And that's my list. Um, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. thank, thank, thanks to your wife. Yeah. <laughs> Ignore the sort of interpersonal family dialogue that goes with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I skipped over it. Um, and thanks for the map, Michael. Um, okay, anything else in the business development committee that I missed? I sort of kind of blew through that pretty quickly. I think the last thing is maybe it's on here surveying. Um, I think you have it as a separate item. I, I, I made it as a separate item so that we could, I could do the overview and then we could dive into actually asking questions. And we are here actually on time. Okay, uh, preferred development route and pilot projects. Um, this was something that um, David Healy put together. If I get to it, this is, this is in the packet. Um, he, al he also put together a little, uh, a little grid for what he imagined the community engagement, the communications plan was. This was his just idea, was sort of an Excel sort of thing with bluish sort of page, uh, on page 10 of the packet, sort of like bluish highlighting where we need to be doing different things in different months. Um, and it was his, he's trying to wrap his brain around what we need to do in order to get, sort of getting stuff done. And I think what the, kind of the main takeaway, the way that he described it was that these are crazy tight, goals, crazy tight deadlines of things that we need to be doing. So wh whether we're going to get to them or not is a, is a big question, but so yeah, like create public website and all these things. But uh, he also brought um, to the Business Development Committee sort of a, a set of scenarios that we should probably try to nail down at this level, kind of the, at the strategic level, before we can even decide what we're going to do at the smaller level. And this is something that he has actually... Um, he dove into in an incredible amount of detail. I don't know that he shared it with everybody, but he has some, um, basically, it's like a three or four page list of all the things that we need to do, which is really friggin' scary. Um, but he's right. But there are some bigger decisions, and I, and I like what he did here, is he tried to consolidate all the bigger decisions and the biggest decisions into this one right here, so that we can 
talk about it, balance pros and cons, and see if there's one of these that makes the most sense for us. <coughs> so page 11 of the packet. And, and just the other thing that we just sort of discussed in the committee was that there needs to be sort of a disclaimer attached to, to this discussion which is that we are very much in preliminary stages. Obviously, there's a lot of money and technical expertise that need to, in, and other things that need to go into making this real. But he was really encountering problems trying to construct a survey without having at least some sort of straw, straw man or whatever to, to build it against, right? So the idea is we, we just got to get going. Let's take our best guess based off of sort of some general assumptions, and then we're going to build out on to that. But it's not committing to <coughs> in perpetuity here. Right. And the, yeah, so yeah, the idea is what, what do we do now, knowing that we will likely have to change, you know, change approaches later on as we go. So um, he suggested that the governing board should decide that what the preferred de preferred development route initially for CB fiber should be. Um, and so he, he wrote the four possible choices are, and I actually added two more after that, so that should really say the six possible choices are. And I'm going to read these without the pros and cons, and then we can sort of look at these and evaluate these and talk a bit more um, before we decide if we, if we decide. First one is focus initial development efforts in areas with the highest potential residential customer density, regardless of how few towns may be included. B, focus initial development efforts on establishment of a corridor that includes multiple towns in an attempt to include as many towns as early as feasible. C, focus initial development on a single town to get a high penetration rate in that town. D, focus initial development in areas with a high density of potential business subscribers to build a high revenue base. And these are uh, ones that I added afterwards. Uh, e, focus initial development in areas where the need is greatest and only DSL is available. F, focus on locations where it is possible to use or extend existing infrastructure. So these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. These are fairly overlapping here. Um, Can I just say something, Jerry? Please. Um, uh, Jerry, David, and I did a subcommittee meeting of that meeting. And the two you added were in our discussions okay. and somehow got dropped. So there you are. Oh, good, good. I'm glad I added them by mental powers. <laughs> and I wonder if there, <clears throat> maybe there's a meta um, strategy, which which is if we're going to be successful in um, going to funding, uh, we need to have uh, a proven track record. Uh, and so, of those strategies, we should do the one that works the best in terms of, uh, you know, finding subscribers and and serve sort of cost benefit to us. Okay. Can I can I ask how much mission plays into a decision when it comes to bond? <coughs> well, I mean, the, there there is uh, a general idea of ser you know serving everybody, right? But I, I, I've got a feeling that if we, we have to be careful about that, and that we probably can't do that right away. So it might be, mission might be important to who we think our customers are, we want them to be, but might not be so important when we're thinking about bonds and promissory. Right. right. I mean, this is af after all business. I mean, it's a mission driven. Business, but still. Business. So I, I had a meeting with uh, ValleyNet yesterday, talking to them about essentially drilling more into the weeds about where we are and asking them some questions and asking them about the feasibility of them being an operator for us. Um, one of the things that they suggested is that while the conventional wisdom is that it does, it will require three years of um, financials to go after bonds, they said. Because this is a reasonably proven structure here, that they've done it, that it's, it may be more possible, that it might, might behoove us to actually go and see whether that's actually a really a requirement or not. Um, which I thought, and that was coming from their, their CFO. He said that might not be as hard of a problem as, as we thought. Um, I have a whole bunch of other of other stuff to bring back from, from Ballynet too, but I'm going to let 
I also want to, I don't want us to do the same things that the private companies are doing. I don't want us to look at density as the prime mover on this, because that's, that's how we are where we are right now. It's just repeating the same mistakes that, uh, what's, whatever the name of that corporation is now that used to be Fairpoint. Consolidated. Consolidated. Yeah. Stupid name. <laughs> Oops, that's on the record. Um, I, 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 so I'm, I'm less inclined towards the, well, we're going to have a high density of subscribers here. I think if we go somewhere that's underserved, we're going to get a density. They've got 3,000 subscribers with DC Fiber right now. That's on their website. 3,000. And they're how many years into this? 10. Mm. Is it 10? Depends mm. on how you measure it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I believe that initially, yes, we might have some fumbling around, but it, I think we should really allow our mission to drive this because I'm very concerned about the population that is constantly overlooked in here and the, the people who are living in these small communities who just don't have a lot of density. And I think we need to represent them. So what, one of the things that I don't want to say may render this whole thing moot, but the advice that I got from, from ValleyNet, and I say that specifically, I'm not talking about EC Fiber, I'm talking about ValleyNet, which is the operating company. They said ValleyNet chose the deployment strategy. Mm. EC Fiber said, hmm. "Good. Here, here's the capital." East Valley Net said, "Okay." Now, how did it, it, since EC Fiber didn't have three years of uh, financials, how did they ma manage to buy? They 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 did have three years of financials they had because they they, they, they crowdfunded for the yeah, first they several years. And they had oh. some help. They had oh. some help. The initial donors. Okay. And Valley Net itself was one of the initial donors that got them going, and then they had another several million dollars of crowdfunding with these promissory notes to get them to the point where they could get to that three years and they could then go to the bond market. As soon as they went to the bond market, they took that, that bond revenue and they paid off their initial investors, mo most of them in the first round. And Did ValleyNet handle the that financial work for them once they came in? Any, anything that was operational, I mean, they, they contracted out for some of the, the legal bits and pieces, but yeah, most of that stuff was... And, and Valley that basically answered these questions that uh, you guys put together and we're going here. Yeah, for, for the most part. And, and there were some, you know, limits of what they could do and some practicality, like there were people who were contributing who were sort of saying, I'm donating so that you can hook me up. And so when they built out um, Barnard, I think is where they started, um, that was where, you know, they built in a non, they built the network in a non-ideal sort of way. Pull, pull the fiber schmendlies. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't mean that we can't do things differently, but I want to tell you what I, what I heard from them. So something else I heard from them is that, um, I pitched a small pilot project in Northfield and Roxbury because they have cables really close. I said, maybe you can extend your network there. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't come out and say it, but the strong suggestion was for a small pilot project like that, the amount of work that they would have to do internally to make that feasible for them, it's just not, it's not something that they would they'd be willing to do. They said, you want to turn on a town? Let's go. So, uh, one question I had is, the thoughts are, are, are one of our 16 of best prototypical like if we, you know, is Worcester just a good all-around kind of? It's got some of a little of everything, and Damn it's a now. good, you know, proving ground. Like, because there is some argument to that strategy. You just pick a town and, and go for it, and you learn a lot, and at least you covered a town, and you know. But then, how? What's the criteria if you even pick up a town? You know, right. That's well, <laughs> so it has a lot to do with the operator, I think, yeah. and looking at East at Valley Net EC Fiber in particular, they're all, they already have customers in Roxbury. I found out. They do, because they, their fiber runs, but in order to serve people in Brookfield, their fiber darts briefly over the, the border of Roxbury and cuts back into, uh, cuts back into uh, Brookfield, and they serve people over there. But yeah, there's people on Steel Hill Road in Roxbury that are currently, right now, EC Fiber customers. So it's easier if they run from where they are into someplace they aren't. I, otherwise, you're going to have to pay for a backhaul to connect the two networks. So it, it, it might make sense to, to say, 
you know, let's fundraise to build Roxbury or whatever. Mm. Uh, something else that, that they suggested, which, um, and, and I, I don't mean to, to sideline this whole discussion, but because this is new and fresh, I think this is uh, um, relevant to the question. They said, you know, go talk to the organizations that could be, um, you know, that could be operators now and, and figure out what are, the, what, what are their plans? What are they going to do? How would they do these things? And they specifically said, and you know, people can, can cringe if they like, but they, they said, go talk to TDS. Yeah. You know, they have infrastructure there. They do have people on staff who, who know fiber to the home. Right. Talk to them and say, where are you building? You want to build it for us? You want to operate it for us? I don't know how I feel about that. Actually, I kind of know how I feel about it, but I don't want to say it. Um, so that was one of the things that they said, and they said the other thing to do is you know, build more fiber, you know, have more strands than you need, because you're, mm -hmm. you, you will, you'll appreciate it two or three years down the road. Mm -hmm. um, wow, I and mean, there's so much. Um, <laughs> Car Car Carol suggested, um, Carol from ValleyNet, DC Fiber suggested for fundraising, she said ask WEC to, um, to invest in a bunch of promissory notes yeah. and partner with them to put it on all of their all of their poles and figure out some way of, of operating it from there. That way you're not talking about taxpayer money and they're investing. They're getting a percentage and because they're a nonprofit, um, that seven point five percent that you're giving them because they're not being taxed on it ends up looking more like an eleven percent return to anybody else. That's the numbers that I'm getting thrown at me from the CFO. So Bill Powell was, um, so Tom and Bob and I all went to the select board meeting um, to talk about, uh, in East Montpelier to talk about the, um, the annual report and budget. And uh, Bill Powell from uh, Washington Electric was there. And he was interested in hearing more about what we're doing and being involved. So. It sounds like there's already been some discussion inside of what about this. And yeah. Maybe they have yeah, a proposal or something that they wanted to talk to us about, but they hadn't yet got to the point that they could come forward with that. <clears throat> All right. One of their board members is on the select board with me, and she and I have had some discussions, she, and she indicated that, yes, they have had internal discussions. They're very interested in this project. They have some small community-based grants yeah. that, you know, not a lot of money, but she was encouraging me to have us apply for one of those, just to, and, and, um, you know, Vermont State Employees Credit Union is another one I realized just the That's other right. day. They have yeah. small community grants. You know, like five hundred to a thousand dollars. Are we in there? They have the SEC. We can list together. Oh, yeah, no, yeah they, we're, they, we're in there actually. They. Um, it depends on how you want to talk about these promissory notes in the beginning, but uh, they actually might be very interested in providing some of the funding you need, uh, depending on the structure in which uh, it's done within. Uh, you know. If there is a potential of a co-op function within this, they can actually invest directly rather than loaning money. So it's worthwhile uh, exploring that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure there's there's ways to make it make it palatable one, one way or the other. I, uh, as a, what you were saying about how you let the operator figure out how they're going to do this makes sense to me. It's like, um, and this is the analogy I came up with. It's probably not going to be. Appreciated, but I'm a developer, and what I want the user to tell me is, what are you trying to accomplish? I'll figure out how to give you that. You tell me what you're trying to accomplish. And so that's kind of what that sounds like to me, right. is that that's what they're saying. Is So it seems like we want to find an operator, and maybe we should be focusing on finding an operator that we can work with. Right, and one of the things they called us specifically, is it's, they said, you don't want a 24-person board like DC Fiber has, or a 16-person <laughs> board like we have making these sorts of operational decisions because we have long discussions. <laughs> Boy, do we. But that, for, but that brings us back to these. These aren't questions just for the, for the operator. These are, these are what we're, we're going to guide the operator with. Right. And, and whether we want to do a whole town or a corridor that's dense and can be successful financially so it will impress the bond market. What Those questions is, really matter now. So what gates is right now? Excuse me? What gates is right now? I, I can look at it, all six of those. We don't have enough information to make that decision. 
and we don't know as a board, especially, I, I'd be very skeptical. So like what gates us right now outside of fundraising and finding an operating partner? What specific answer do you need that would stop us from accomplishing either of those two goals? There's more than those two. Well, the only, but those are the two most important things yeah. we can do to start, get money and find an operating partner. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so all of these are inextricably linked. Do we have, I mean, I guess this is more of a philosophical discussion than anything. Or is there anything, is there anything in here that, re, that leaps out at you and says, no, we shouldn't do this, or yes, we must do this. I think you know, Siobhan came, came out of the gate saying that we probably shouldn't focus on density, and that's the advice that I'm getting from ValleyNet and Fiber is that they're saying focus on the underserved. Yeah, I, I think Siobhan is, I, I totally agree with her. I, I, I think the mission of this organization is the strongest selling point we have, and whether it will actually result in the most cash raised and the most quickly, I don't know. But I think the strength of the mission is something that will be appealing to, I think, a lot of people who are willing to support us by giving us money and getting connected. Unlike, unlike most corporations who are, you know, responsible to their shareholders, we're responsible to the towns we represent. Right? They would leave um, us. They would leave us at the drop of a hat if somebody gave them a better deal. Oh yeah. And so, <laughs> and so, I mean, the, yeah. I mean, that, I think, I think that that's an important thing. That obviously, I'm glad you brought it up, Siobhan, because that's that should be in the forefront of our primary responsibility. Obviously, is to. So is to I'd like to twist the concept of dens density a little bit. Um, we should go for density, but the density is the subscriber density, not the population density, mm -hmm. not the business density. So if there's a very underserved town, we may get 40 or 50 percent take rate in that town, and we'll have density which will drive a business which will impress the bond market. But if we go to a town, sorry Montpelier, they're very well served, and it's going to be a lot harder to, to get that kind of business case from that. And so the two ideas actually come together. If you go to a town that's underserved, you're going to get, unless it's very sparsely populated as well, then you're going to get a business case. Okay. And, if you, and so while we're having this conversation, please look at page 13 of, of the packet. That's more data that David pulled together in terms of uh, density and how many miles of roads have certain densities in, by town, broken down by town. I think, uh, Rama, you had a question before. Well, it's actually not, not a question so much. It's a, it's a combination of things. One, one is... I do think that if you sat down and took a look at what I had drafted up for policies and procedures, it would mirror what's being presented here in the sense that I, I think it would lead us to the question of what, uh, what should we be doing first, getting somebody to actually op do the operations for us or try to develop these plans, mm -hmm. you know? So I, th I, I agree that I think we really need to focus on getting an operator and However, we feel we want to do that. Whatever, our, whether we want to directly hire a business manager or whether we want to contract out with something like, you know, ValleyNet or whatever, I, I think that we really need to do that. But going back to this list as a list of principles that we would, as a board, that would be our, our place to put on anybody that we hired to operate <coughs> our system for us. I'll go back to what I said a meeting or a couple meetings ago that. You know, to, to me, the first thing is to get the organization <coughs> up, running, and stable. And that means in the very beginning, I am going to be very agnostic as to how we get it financially stable for the very beginning. I'm willing to overlook some things in order to get an organization that, that can function. I, in the long run, yeah, I, I mean, you know, underserved, but there's also people that need to be better served. And, you know, Williamstown's full of underserved, people that need to be better served, and people that have really great service right now but might like to go with a municipal organization because that's what they'd like to support. But, so I, I'm willing to accept pretty much anything that anybody puts out there that can generate revenue to get the organization funded. I kind of like the concept you put out there that, you know, if you look at, if you look at the possible customer base, forget about density of population, but density of customer, you know, possible customer base, 
I, I, frankly, I don't care. I, I'll let somebody that knows the business better than me sit there and tell me where the most money is going to come from, and I'll say yes. Because that, that's what I, from my perspective, that's where I think, I, you know, is, is most important philosophically at this point. Once we're on solid ground, and I would say once we, if we can get something, anything set up after this first year, I think we'll be on solid ground. And then we can be more particular about how we move forward. I mean, I think, I think uh, at the end of the day, as people have pointed out, this is a, sort of a chicken, it's not really a chicken and egg situation. Basically, we need money and we need a provider, right? Um, and we're, we're trying to approach the money piece, we're trying to tackle the money piece, because this is a partnership between us and the provider, right? What do we bring to the table to the provider? We bring capital, basically. That's about it, right? Um, we, we, there, bring, we bring marching orders, too. We bring marching orders. And that's, we, that's the third piece. And we do have, we, we have to concentrate on what it is we want right. them to do for us right. before we choose them. Right. Even. And we do, but we do have the, we also have the potential to leverage. You know, there's there's some potential for some regulatory leverage too at some point down the line where we might be able to get a carve out for ourselves in some capacity or another. Right. Let's set that aside for now. But my point is, is that I th it sounds to me like what we really need is we need somebody to develop in partnership potentially with with one of these providers develop some sort of you know, request for proposal so that we have a target for raising money. You know, like, if we're, if we're talking about raising money, these people are going to do this for free. We need to establish sort of what they need to, to, to tell us what our target community is, right? Tell us what, what the most ideal community for them to go into right now is. So I would propose that we either by committee or by individual, uh, you know, reach out to somebody, Develop that, develop a proposal, get an, and then get some proposals from people to develop an idea of what what what, what our target is for money. Does that sound? Yeah. So I mean, I, I I think I have a pretty good idea of, you know, what the, what next steps with with ValleyNet would be, but I think for them it would be really only feasible to have to talk about full town builds mm -hmm. uh, in towns that are you know contiguous to their network. So we're really talking about Williamstown, Northfield, Roxbury. Mm -hmm. That's convenient. So, so it might make sense to talk to a few different providers and see right. what works best in their in their business interest, mm -hmm. um, right? Because there might be some that are aligned in other places in in our in our service area. Yeah, I would think like even First Light might be actually in the Berlin area uh, at this point, so it might be a provider we might want to approach. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I know they, they also, they yeah, built they, a they they line between the, the schools in Williamstown and Northfield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, can I ask, are we talking about approaching possible providers, or are we talking about finding a consultant who would help us approach possible? Right. Because, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I actually think one of the people who we all know is out of work right now <laughs> is the person who is pushing statewide fiber. Yeah. And she wanted to have it done by utilities Maybe. being required to put <laughs> string wires on their poles. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be fun to talk to Christine Hawkless. She could probably raise her own salary with grant writing. Well, that I might be. Yeah. That's, that's, actually, that's a terrific idea. I mean, I sort of, that sort of bounced into the back of my mind. I, I, I have had conversations with her about communications union districts in, in general before the election, but... so. I mean, I, I have this fantasy that Phil Scott's going to offer her the position okay. of state, yeah. build out the internet yeah. Yeah. position, you know, but I don't think he's, I don't think he would do that. But, I, I she might, she but, might but should, should we go and try to grab her and yes. have her build this? Yes. Well, I mean, I mean, talk with her whether she'd be interested. No. I, would, I would defer to experts no. in the room uh, on this particular topic as to who we choose. Maybe even have a committee that's looking for a consultant. I think it'd be great to have her come and talk to us, and then we can think about her ideas. So, but the, but well, the I, idea of I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying it. we just like pick her out of you know pick her out of the air just because Alan mentioned it, but in terms of that <coughs> sort of person who's going to go and own the process yeah, of that, that finding the operator. Certainly. Any other <laughs> thoughts? Or unappealing. Uh, you know, somebody who's got yeah. both the mental bandwidth and the time and the, the, the vision to and want the experience, to, and so the experience to want to, you know, kick the ball. That would be great. 
talk to her quickly before she mm -hmm. finds another job. Yeah. Could, could we call her an executive director, which might help her in, in her other other we, endeavors? We, we, we could call the position <coughs> a, a lot of different things, yeah. I, I think. But I think... Are there, so devil's advocate, are there other likely people that would fit the same exactly. profile? Like there, I, mean, I, 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 mean, I mean, I think, I don't know. I, 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 she, she's an a electricity executive, right? She does yeah. electricity. Isn't there, there? I mean, there's a difference between electricity oh, and the internet. But, but, but the I, I don't know. I just, I'm just, oh, the, the I'm just wondering if there's like a person who would know more. Than I think the co-op background is really important because yep. I mean, she, she, she was able to to sketch out a plan how you could finance actually doing something like this, and it was based on her experience. So, so could could we could we agree in principle that this is the sort of this is our logical next step is to find somebody. Who is going to be getting drawing a salary in some form or another? Who is going to be also possibly raising money mm -hmm. and doing this sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not, not sure. I'm, I'm not sure that everybody's on on, on board sure. here. Yeah. So, so, so what, what 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 do you see our next step to be then, Michael? I don't think we're looking for a savior to, to lead us. I think we want to tell someone what we want them to do. And Christine might be that person, or other good people might be that person, but it's more important that we set, in my opinion, what our objectives are before we ride someone else's horse. That's my first impression, but I, I could be swayed. Okay. Haven't we set our objectives, though? I mean, well, don't we have even we have these questions goals? right here are really crucial questions of how do we want to focus on the community? But we don't have the ability to. I mean, we don't have the ability to answer things like density ourselves. But we don't but, have the experience but, but, or technical but, knowledge. Ph that. Philosophically speaking, I, I think we're all. I, I think we're generally to consensus that underserved is the way to go. Sure. Kill me if I'm. Yeah, I'm misspeaking. No, but it, I, I think it's more than that. Like you that. said, a lot of these are overlapping, right? I don't so, that's right. I could go so if you were to problem. grab the, the underserved with the dense population, throw in what was F here, you know, for you, so there's already some uh, you know, locations where there's extending the, the, the existing infrastructure that may already exist for maybe a, an ease or a straight shot or whatnot that we could follow along. If, if we could find that that unicorn, if you will, <coughs> of all these things together, mm -hmm. then that would be a clear clear path for us to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just throughout the term, the, what I'm hearing is you might want to invite Christine to give a pitch because that allows this body to take on what she's saying partly to inform whatever your next steps are, but she may have something that's like 90% of the way there, which then would allow this body to add some more flesh to it and follow up. But it may be no, because her approach may be something that the board, after listening, says, you know, I heard that a couple things were good, but no. But I, I, I take it as I offer to make a pitch, giving her the parameters, the history of this discussion. Make a pitch. To, to, to what end? To, to, to function as a telecommunications consultant to the board? To develop a business plan or a pitch Not is either. up to I, to me. It's up to her. She okay. would frame. It's her pitch. This is what I would provide to this body. And so, so, so maybe what we need is an is an RFP, a request for a pitch. Oh. Or <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> and but, but we ask. Could, but we, could ask, we frame it as request for advice as opposed to a pitch yeah, on yeah, her behalf? Yeah. Yeah, I think we should have her come and advise us what she, what she thinks would be good thing. We've been working on this for eight months. We're at this point where we think we've gotten to a new level where we're really grappling with some of the base issues we have to decide, and we don't want to make any mistakes. We try and want to mitigate the number of mistakes we're going to make. So could you just meet with us and hear what we have to say, and you ask us questions, we're asking you questions. I think questions. there needs to be a little bit of a, more of a carrot there, but that's... But, but, let, but, let's, <laughs> but let's open it up to everybody. Let's not just say, because we, you know, this former former gubernatorial candidate, because the, the, the name is recognized and easily, you know, memorable, that we should necessarily say that she's going to be the one. There might be, there's probably other folks out there that could do similar 
right. give some other advice. Of all the people who could be asked to re-pick her brain, <laughs> and she's the only person who really laid out a vision mm -hmm. for how you could build that internet in the state. Now, whether it could work or not, we don't know, but I think it's just a logical thing that we would invite somebody like her to just say, well, here's what I've been thinking, and this is where I think you, as a communications union district, could use the structure to do X, Y, and Z that's on your agenda. I support that suggestion, but limit it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. And promptly. I think if Phil Scott hasn't already made that offer, it'll come awfully soon. No, it won't. No. He'd be nuts. He's not going to spend that money. <laughs> and I wonder how far we want to go in terms of uh, attaching some numbers to this. It's one thing to find a thousand customers, and if it costs a million dollars to serve them, and you know they'll give us that million dollars back in five years, it's great. If it takes 25 years to get that million dollars back, it doesn't work. Um, and so, rather than just uh, approach this philosophically and find somebody who's got some great ideas and similar philosophy and all that, I think we might need to go further. Yep, I, 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 I think you're right, but I think that follows. Does, does, do, did the company, share, I can't remember the cooperative, did it, did it have competitors? Was it in a competitive marketplace? Which one? Do you the, see? Yeah. No. Okay, so, okay, yep. No. So, so much of her advice will not be totally germane to what we're doing. Correct. I, I just I, I, my point is is that is that I'm all for asking anybody we can for advice as much advice as possible. Um, when it comes to I mean we're about to go through a lot of pain raising money, and we're and we're going to be entrusted by the people that give us money to make good decisions, make transparent decisions, and make decisions that take into account many factors and are rigorous. So I just want to be very you know, I just want to be clear that that's, that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're talking about potentially hiring a consultant, first of all, we don't have money, so that's an issue. But once we do have money, we, I think we have to be very, very rigorous in our approach. And I don't know if that's a policy already, that we, we have a requirement for RFPs and things like that, but I, I definitely should be. So, um, Alan, if you, if you could, could you, could you again could you repeat the way that you framed it that Mike, Michael liked the way that you framed it? Michael, if you can paraphrase what, what Alan said, just so that um, we can, just so, so that we can all get you know, wrap our brains around what we're doing after. And I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. <laughs> okay. <Good. laughs> if you're wrong. Uh, Alan and I move that. No, don't start a motion. <laughs> no, just no, just describe no, it again. No, okay, so. We would like to extend an invitation to Christine Halquist on the basis of the fact that she put a lot of energy into thinking about a telecommunications plan for the state. And we would like to ask her to detail that plan as it would apply to our, our 15 towns and um, offer us any advice that she might have that we might consider. And that's it. And then afterwards, if we've fallen in love, we can take another step. But that would be a really good start. Okay. Is there any who's willing to do that outreach? I can call our campaign manager. Does anybody know her? At all? I mean, I met her once. I, 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 I know her a little times. bit. But I, I had like four or five meetings with her campaign. Okay. If you give me your contact information, I'll call. I'm not ashamed to ask people in public. <laughs> That's not a one observation. There is a difference between asking her advice on what others should do and what she would do. And I, 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 you know, I come from a planning background, and one of the great failings of planning is you get all these great ideas of what other people can do. Mm -hmm. And it is so hard to translate that into action. So that's why I like, ask her, what would you do? And again, we're not promising her that she gets to do it, but it is a different question. And it's one that I think moves us faster. Just, I'll just throw that as an observation. I'm comfortable with that too. Mm. 
And we could ask you both questions. Okay. But we're not offering a job. We're not saying there's, no. there's no. a job no. here. No. We're, no. Just, no. we're just saying, if right. you were in our shoes, what would you do? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because she's pegged this already as an issue that is priority for. Yeah. So, so, so who is it that's comfortable with the, the questions that are being, that are going to be asked and that are willing to reach out to her? Is that we're hearing Rama and Elliot? And Elliot or so? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll text Cam. Now, other people we could invite who aren't available but could give advice, like Carol Monroe and Stan mm -hmm. Williams mm -hmm. have given you advice, we could invite the people in charge of Burlington Telecom. We could invite people in charge of cable companies, all kinds of different telecommunications companies with experience competing for customers mm -hmm. um, might, might have a perspective that's different from what mm -hmm. Christine has. Right, and, my, and one of my personal things to do, I'm, to, I'm just going to do it, you can tell me not to if you like, but um, as I was going to contact TDS, you know, Carol suggested that I see you know, what are they, you know, what are they doing? What are they planning? Do they want to, do they want to partner for some part of, of a project? And just, I got this from them in the mail just the other day. Yeah, <laughs> what's it? Well, it says for twenty nine ninety five for three years I could have... TDS internet a, and security line phone bundle. Mm. Speeds up to 50 Mbps. You're never going to get 50 megabytes out. I have no idea what you're saying. You don't want to talk to TDS. So, so not, 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 not until we pull that strand to your house yeah. are you going to get 50 megs. Sorry. <laughs> and, so, and the other thought I have is about inviting people is invite people from outside of our area to get good, clean advice that isn't tainted by conflicts of interest and, and competitive thoughts. So I, I, I'll just put out an open invitation. If those, those people exist, consider it an assignment to each of you. Talk to them and tell me, hey, they can come to the next meeting. Just, just tell me that and they will go on the agenda. I think this sort of like waiting for motions and like uh, orders for people that slows us down. If you, like mm -hmm. somebody, like wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, you're like, this person has to come, then just calmly go compose an email and hit send in the morning, right? Yeah. And I was, I mean, I was, I was a consultant for eight years. We weren't stupid. When somebody said, do you, can you come by and give us 30 <laughs> minutes of advice? We'd say, absolutely. <laughs> We're not sure. going to tell you exactly what to do, but we'll come by and we'll, we'll tell you what we would do. Yeah. You know, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we can get plenty of free advice. First thing we do is get a video recording of this meeting, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are there any other uh, specific su specific guy. suggestions um, for people that we ought to be reaching out to? Waitsfield Champlain, maybe. Waitsfield Telecom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll certainly they would certainly be. Well, they're contiguous. Or contiguous. abutting us, anyways. Yeah. yeah. Is it any, I, I don't know anybody over there. Do you? Hmm. Would you? Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else? I'm, I'm, I think I'm also going to reach out to Trans Video. They're yeah. almost exclusively cable, but I'm not 100% sure if they're willing to go do other stuff. But I, but I think, yeah, if I said, you know, we're going to start a capital campaign so that you can build up the rest of Northfield. I'm not, I'll take notice. Not, not sure that they would say no to that. Yeah. But, okay. Stow cable, <coughs> possibly. Okay. They have a lot of fiber. And again, contiguous to Elmore, anyways, or Worcester. Mm -hmm. yeah. Contiguous to Worcester, too. Yeah. <laughs> what about Wick? <laughs> hmm? Wick. Yeah, they're, they are, they're also in, in my pipeline of people that, that I'm going to talk to and actually, and Carol actually said specifically, she said, if you're going to a meeting with them to talk about this, if you get like a sit-down meeting, she said she's coming out. So, oh, great. Cool. Um, so I, I had, all right, later. Yeah, public, public <laughs> meeting. Yeah. Sorry, everyone else. Sorry. Okay, um, so how does everybody feel with that sort of kind of vague marching orders Right now, is that okay to get us through till December? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, the, the only question I now, with vague marching orders, is that, is our goal to 
have somebody acting as I, I, I'm, I'm just going to use the I, I don't want to use the phrase executive director, but some you know an operations manager. Is that our goal to come up with an operations manager of some sort, whether an organization or an individual within a time period here? Or? I'm I'm not sure that we can avoid doing that. I mean, if, if somebody if we're going to do any sort of real planning, that's going to require real work. There's got to be some real people behind it. Yeah. I mean. I mean, and so, and I'd certainly appreciate everything that everybody here does, but I don't know that anybody at the table has the bandwidth to take on a, arguably a full-time job. No, I, I agree. I just want us to get past the vague, you know, let's talk to people that, you know, at a certain point, even if we can't be perfect about our choice, we have to make a choice and we have to move on and start doing stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, I... I I think I just in my head I, I'm envisioning I was envisioning a fit, like some sort of phased approach where we get money to get a consultant to help us make a plan, right? And then we take that plan, we bring it to we develop an RFP based on that. The plan, plan is used to hire somebody. Yeah, exactly. That's how I would envision it. Right. Okay. It's really important to get. It's. It's not sufficient to get someone to get started. It's really important to get someone really good. Yeah. Because I won't name organizations, but certain organizations really languished because they had the wrong people mm -hmm. for years, yeah. and that we don't want that to happen to us. So for sure. it's yeah. Okay. Um, with all of your um, approval, I would like to remove the remote telecommunications plan discussion. Um, you have the remote telecommunications plan in your packet. I'm sure you read all 100 and change pages of it. <laughs> I've read most of it, sadly. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm not sure. It's dead. I'm not sure that there's anything tonight that we're going to get out of it. I think, I think that last agenda item is probably the real meat and potatoes tonight. Mm -hmm. So let's let's bump that off to to our next meeting if we want to continue talking about it. Um, review of back burner items, committee assignments, and membership. Um, I think we have some assignments still pending for some of the, the committees. Um, is there anything else that needs to be put out formally in terms of assignments? What those back burner items down at the bottom of the agenda? Uh, yeah. We had a discussion at our bylaw and policy meeting about the fact that Mr. Whitaker might still be a member of the bylaw and policy committee because of the fact that he was appointed. So, uh, did you notice that committee assignments and membership at the end there? Yes. So, I'm going to make a move that we rescind Stephen Whitaker's appointments to any and all committees related to Central of My Internet CD Fiber. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Who's, I'm sorry, who is the second? I wasn't looking. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Yeah. Um, he's a really difficult person. But he's also, he can be constructive some of the time. And he can contribute. And I'm going <coughs> to abstain or vote no banning him from participating as a public member of the committee. I don't think we're I banning think him from participating as a member of the public. I think we're... No, we said as a member of a committee. I think we're, we're rescinding his committee membership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as, a vo as a voting... As a voting member. Yeah. It's difficult, because, I mean... Yeah, I'm, he's, not, he's not the only person who's got good ideas. He's not the only person out there who can no. help us. Oh, that's for sure. I'm also very torn. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not at all. No. Okay. I am not at all torn on this. I, I, I have other better ways, more constructive <laughs> ways of using my time. Okay. And, and listen, I agree. When, when I met, when I met uh, Mr. Whitaker there, is one, you know, one of the things that struck me was the fact that he, he did have a vision. He knew where he, he wanted to go. Yeah. And I have a lot of respect for that. He's obviously intelligent and well-informed, but... Uh, at what cost? I, yeah, I, I, I just, okay. there's ways for him to be able to have that input and for us to welcome it without mm -hmm. having him as a formal part of the process, mm -hmm. if he so chooses. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'll abstain. Mm -hmm. abstain. Okay. Callus abstains. Okay. So, uh, three abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so um, back burner items, uh, reach other towns. Oh, Jim has a, oh, yeah. We, oh, the bylaw and policy committee currently only has four members, 
and it might be helpful to have a fit uh, simply to make sure we don't, at least to make sure we don't have deadlock. I promise not to show up. <laughs> and there, and we, we don't have, these don't have to be board members again. So if there's somebody else floating around out there who's maybe not yet a board member. <clears throat> so Jim, maybe same. you're asking, do people think about who might be a good fifth member in the next meeting? We can talk about some nominees. Well stated, Alan. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, anything else of um, committee assignments, back burner items, outreach to other communities, net neutrality, love the telecommunications plan on again next next month. Cal's pilot discussion, public safety committee, do any of these need to be removed or added to the next agenda or put on a committee? I think the Cal's right. pilot discussion could go away because we're talking about mm -hmm. the other stuff and whether yeah. we're gonna be doing a pilot at all mm -hmm. as part of the operations and getting this person who might inform us and getting the company that comes in. I, I, I think continually stirring this on the back burner is, is going right, to be smelling. Right. 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 It could still happen, it just doesn't have yeah. to be a specific yeah. Yeah. distraction. Yeah. Yeah. More or less consensus. Yeah. I have one piece that is sort of peripherally relative to the uh, net neutrality thing uh, that concerns our uh, ORCA and every other um, cable access, pro government access uh, program. There is a motion uh, movement within the FCC. Where they're closing comments tomorrow about removing the subsidies uh, that cable companies have to provide uh, for the access operations. Uh, I've asked Rebecca, and she already did send around a letter that I got with a link within it that, get, that has an article that has the comment link and I would urge everybody to send some kind of a comment to the FCC through that link about the uh, idiocy of removing uh, this valuable service that which we at least in Vermont and other places I know use extensively and it would be a shame to lose. Do you remember about when you sent that so we can easily find it? For it's uh, Rebecca sent it and oh, she sent it, it during, uh, during meeting. the meeting. Okay. Great. So it's it's in your inbox now. Okay. Is it? Is it totally sorry, sorry, I don't look. <laughs> what is you have a couple of emails from me. Nope. The, the FCC <laughs> is considering and closing comments tomorrow. Uh, so it has to happen within the next uh, day. Okay. Uh, comments on uh, the, this motion, uh, um, Article 2, uh, uh, remove the requirements <laughs> that cable companies, uh, or actually insulate cable companies from having to provide support for access operations. Okay. And we probably don't have enough time to draft a board. No. No, no we couldn't okay. work more in a meeting and do that in time. If, if you've never made an FCC comment before, it would be advisable to just go to that docket. Is the docket listed? Yes, it is. And read some of the previous comments from others to see the kind of legal format that the FCC likes to receive, and then it'll be yep. more acceptable to them. Hmm. Anything that needs to go on the back burner that we need to continue, continue to have not on the agenda, but sort of simmering? The, the outreach to other towns. Do we do, do we need to keep that there for right now, or do we know, do we want to just kind of drop that so we can start focusing on what we have? I think we need. I think we should. You know, I mean, if other towns want to join, great. But that outreach from them to us, I think. You know, I I don't think we should be right now. I, I mean, you, you listen to the discussions tonight. And, you know, there's a lot of operational stuff that we are potentially getting ready to. See, start happening. Yeah. I agree. I agree, too. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Net neutrality stay on the, the back burner? That's the, like, the last remaining thing on the back burner, then? Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. Just to leave something. Yes, that, that last one. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Done with that. Um, approval of the October 9th meeting minutes. Everybody should have that in their packet too. Again, ongoing kudos to backup for putting the, these together. 
going well above and beyond the requirements for most minutes like you'd see in other public bodies. I move we accept the minutes for the October 9th meeting. Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Uh, round table. Start to have. Uh, pass. Uh, there was one thing I forgot to say when we were in a discussion about um, in the packet, there was a, a table that David had created for us with um, potential revenues for different towns based on road miles and population and um, we were talking about the different kinds of density um, he used the same take rate for every town that's not how it works um, we're not going to get 40 percent of Montpelier and we might get more than 40 percent in Roxburgh and so when when any of us looks at a table like that and starts to think about how much money we can make in a town based on we have to take that into account. Tag on the cost to simply probably have to figure out who our operator is and they would probably have some say on, well, actually, our trucks have to go from this place to that place, and that's going to change the cost. Mm -hmm. The cost of building in Montpelier is going to be twice as much. Yeah. yeah. Right. Let's all put our chips in, um, make our donations, get some skin in the game, get the organization some capital to get going and make a commitment to get this thing rolling. Whatever it is that you can make, let's do it. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that I think we made a lot of progress tonight, um, and never was it contentious. Uh, it was a lot of good discussion and disagreement, but that you know, teased out uh, ideas from us, and I think uh, I'm glad we're finally rolling in that direction. That's great. Um, thanks to everybody for continuing to show up and look like we're going to hit our hit our time here. Um, if anybody would like to join me for the meeting with the Central Mutt Regional Planning Commission or with WEC whenever that happens or with either of the other, um, in, any of the ISPs that I'm planning on communicating with, let me know and I will try to hook you into those as well. That's all I got. Um. I'm excited to be like doing things, <laughs> not just taking minutes, but um, not that that's not important. Um, and I was just going to say real quickly, um, one of the reasons that I chose ZipBooks for our accounting is that it has a lot of like analysis functionality um, so that we can you know, ask it questions and do interesting things with the data in addition to our basic computing. Um, I have requested an alternate for Orange. Um, the select board's going to see if they can think of anybody. <laughs> We're just kind of going to burn a little bit. So. That's it. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think David and I are, are both happy with the way things are moving along. We tend to be pretty impatient, and um, <laughs> this is taking a long time. But I think. Tonight, we definitely saw some movement toward, I mean, it's, it's kind of a log jam with all this many people trying to do everything, and we've got to break that at some point. I think the best thing that uh, Jeremy said in our committee meeting was he was just like, you know what, everyone's just going to be happy if you just if you just go out and do some stuff. <laughs> it's okay. Just make a website. Who cares? Just put it up. Don't, don't wordsmith. And I think that that's sort of for the time being, the watchword, right? Like, there's a there's an online database of every single municipal uh, fiber network in the entire country. You know, if you have an extra 15 minutes, you could call them, see see if they had a good consultant. If they liked their consultant, if they like they liked their approach. What worked? What didn't? That's totally something that you could do in 15 minutes. So, just saying. Um, so I, I like what Jim had to say. We should. Pony up. I was embarrassed that Fort Beckton had to put 125 bucks of her own money on the line, so I hope we can relieve you of that burden <laughs> shortly. Um, I've, I've gotten really interested in rural issues, partly through the discussions that we've been having and also through 
school consolidation issues I've gotten involved in because I'm now on the Worcester School Board. And I, I think rural America is, is, is coming to the fore as one of the, one of the forgotten and really desperate me, uh, parts of this country. And there are gonna be, <clears throat> there are gonna be a lot of opportunities to do some really good things. So I'm happy that we're beginning to get in gear and get moving. I'm good. Let's go. Is <laughs> <laughs> there any part, parting words or comments? Ken, you want to let's take uh, some? I, sure, I'll just build off what Alan said. Um, um, in that this recent election uh, also identified a, a schism between the rural and urban America. <laughs> Vermont is unique. We are largely rural. We're also progressive. And I actually think the telecommunications piece is a way to weave those threads that Vermont has a unique positive to. Um, we have strong connections to urban communities. They, they, they are an economic engine for us, and yet we're rural. And I think it's the telecommunications that might really help our rural aspects flourish in ways that I think the rest of the country doesn't quite get. Thanks very much. I move that we adjourn. Second. Thank you.